I'm Ernie Humphrey, the Vice President of Educational Programs for Performative, the online community and resource for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. First, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar, Best Practices for Managing Currency Risk, Weathering the Euro Storm and Beyond. The roles of the CFO and treasurer are evolving to own emerging issues that rise to the attention of the CEO, the board of directors, and stock analysts. The increasing dynamics of global political conditions financial markets and currency markets in particular have caused currency risk to be elevated to that level. Recent earning re earnings reports clearly show how FX risk management can visibly impact company shareholder value. CFOs and treasurers are increasingly being tasked with explaining his or her company's FX exposures to the board of directors and in the case of public companies to the investment community. Our content today will offer an overview of current emerging euro currency market conditions a discussion of best practices in mitigating and managing currency risk relevant to company of all sizes, and a compelling case study from one of the most renowned companies in the world around their quest to become currency agnostic. I would like to thank FireApps and Treasury Strategies whose commitment to thought leadership make this event possible and delivered at no cost like everything on performative. Again, a quick note about today's agenda. First, we will hear a joint presentation, a presentation from renowned currency expert Wolfgang Koster, who will enlighten us as to what what is happening and what will happen to the euro in 2012. This will be followed by a series of three interactive presentations moderated by Andy Gage from Fire Apps. We will then conclude with an interactive Q&A discussion that I will moderate with our session speakers, where we will spend the remainder of our time. We would like this to be an interactive experience for you. So, if you have any questions at any time, Please go to the questions area in your GoToWebinar panel and send us your question. We can't promise to get to all of them, but we will do our best and we'll follow up afterwards on any questions we did not get to. A few logistical notes. We will post the presentation and the webinar recording on the performative site where it will be freely available to all those who wish to access the recording and the slide. We are also offering CPE credits for the CPAs in today's audience if you did not check the box for the CPE credit to be sent to you on the way in, what we'll do is we'll have a slide up later in the presentation, and you can send uh, an email to Tanya Walsh, our events manager, and she will take care of that um, on that end of it. Uh, okay, um, I'd like to get started with uh, introducing um, our speakers, our renowned speakers here. Um, we have Wolfgang Koster, Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Board Fire Act. Fire Apps, Wolfgang Coaster has managed risk for Fortune 100 companies as well as government, including G10 since 1986. Prior to forming RimTech, he served as president of GFTA, uh, Trend, Trend Alaskan Incorporated, and a, a quantitative currency manager. Wolfgang holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Arizona State and a master's degree in international management from the Gavin School of International Management. He's named one of the 100 Most Influential People in Finance by Treasury and Risk in 2007 and 2009 as a member of Global Exchange's 2007 Who's Who in Foreign Exchange List. He regularly contributes to publications including Treasury and Risk, AFP Exchange, and GT News, and he's a member of the editorial board of AFP Risk Newsletter. We're also very honored to, to have with us um, Brent, Brent Kalinikos, Vice President and Treasurer of Google. Brent has been the VP Treasurer of Google since, 19, since 2007. In mid-late 2011, he also assumed management responsibility for worldwide accounting and tax. He served as the Chief Financial Officer of the Platform Services and Division at Microsoft Corporation from 2006 to 2007. Prior to that, he served as Vice President Worldwide Licensing and Pricing at Microsoft Corporation. He also previously served as Microsoft's VP and Treasurer for four years. He joined Microsoft in late 1992 before joining Microsoft, he worked in various finance and accounting positions for Walt Disney Company and Procter & Gamble. He, is a, he has been a director of EOS Climate Incorporated since 2011. He also serves as a member of the advisory board for Fire Apps. He served on two Washington State's Government Council of Economic Advisors from 2001 to 2006. Brent has received numerous leadership awards, including a 2008 Risk Magazine Award for Corporate Risk Manager of the Year and a 2010 Adam Smith Award for Overall Treasury Excellence. In 2009, he was named one of the 100 most influential people in finance by Treasury and Risk Management for the fourth time. Brent holds a CPA and holds a Bachelor of Science, an MBA 
from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, UNC, and, and, and they, UNC awarded him the Distinguished MBA Alumni Award in 2004. We're also thrilled to have Lori McCauley, CTP. Lori's a partner at Treasury Strategies and leads their Treasury Technology Consulting Practice. She brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to clients from her 28 years of experience in corporate treasury and bank capital markets. She has held senior treasury positions with three Fortune 500 corporations where she worked on treasury reorganization projects as well as policy execution and treasury technology assessment and implementation products. She also has several years experience in bank capital markets and fixed income. Lori is a certified treasury professional and has earned a BA with honors in international relations from Pomona College and her MBA from Seattle University. Finally, we're also thrilled to have Andy Gage, Vice President of Fire Apps. Andy joined the company as Vice President of Marketing in the summer of 2006 and subsequently took on the role of Vice President of Sales. Andy has accumulated over 16 years of experience in marketing, project management, and consulting. Uh, he was most recently Vice President of Marketing and Product Management for Destin R Technologies, where he had global oversight for all aspects of marketing and project strategies. Prior to Destinar, Andy was Vice President of Marketing and Industry Solutions at Cyclone Commerce. He also spent several years providing strategic consulting services for Deloitte Consulting. Andy holds an MBA from the University of Texas, Austin, and a bachelor's degree from the University of Arizona. With that, I'd like to hand the floor over to Andy Gage. Andy? Thank you, Ernie. I uh, appreciate the introduction and um, appreciate everybody's attendance today. And um, uh, Ernie, if you wouldn't mind just uh, flipping back a slide just so we can touch briefly on the agenda before we, uh, we go into the sections here. Um, as, as Ernie mentioned at the outset, I think we've got a very compelling uh, panel as well as a, an agenda to get through today. And um, as we get into the session today, we're going to have Wolfgang, our, our CEO of Fire Apps, uh, really begin to paint a picture about uh, what we're seeing uh, across market trends, uh, both from a currency standpoint as well as from an organizational and corporate uh, standpoint. I think there's some key themes out there that uh, we're seeing a, a lot of companies struggle with, and, and we want to make some key points on that that will frame up some of the additional conversations as we go through this. Obviously, we, we've also got a great uh, uh, presenter in, in Brent Klinikos. He'll be touching on a lot of the, the key themes around how a company such as is, is complex and as diverse as uh, Google uh, is, is dealing with currency risk and specifically the euro. And uh, Lori will, will kind of tie this together from a uh, treasury and technology standpoint. Um, with that, Wolfgang, if you wouldn't mind just uh, starting off and, and making some opening comments here and, and really begin to take us into the, the market trend section, I would appreciate that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Andy. What, what I, as I looked at this and as we were preparing for the webinar, what I got excited about as we got this panel together is really talking about how Treasury has really evolved and changed, significantly changed, um, since uh, the, certainly the financial crisis in 2008. And I think that getting the perspective of Brent, who's been a firm believer ever since I've known him, and including the last five plus years, I think now you're almost at seven, I think, at, at Google, um, with his team, how they've really prepared in advance of this, not necessarily predicting a financial crisis, but really how they've been thinking about risk management, how they're, how they're evolving through that process of first and foremost understanding exposures and taking it through that process. And then, and secondly, from uh, Lori's perspective, to really start looking at what is, has she seen and her evolution over the last two, two and a half years, uh, talking to lots of corporations and supporting them a in the process of really evolving into Treasury 3.0. And then Andy at the end discussing really how corporations in general, he is seeing them leverage technology to address a very complex problem. So that's, that's what excites me about today. And just to stand then the stage of this, um, looking at this slide first and getting into the, the trends here, really most people familiar with this. Currency volatility is at levels 20, in some cases up to 50% higher than it was pre-2008. That in itself creates a significant increase in risk, even if people would stay at doing business the same way they have in the past, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And on top of it, what I think is very key here is that the currencies that used to all be quoted against the dollar used to be decently, many of them correlated, highly correlated um, uh, versus all against the dollar. 
And that really has changed the watch, which, which then starts, you used to have in even 2005 and six CFO, CEO saying, well, the dollar is going up against the euro and therefore there's just dollar strength all over. That's not an assumption that one can make anymore and, and that's creating an environment that uh, has additional risk associated with it. So I think that that's pretty relevant as we go into the next part of this thing. So what we have seen though is actually that the uh, volatility and lower correlation of currencies um, has actually an additional problem for corporation which is that the growth potential for corporations is actually to just continue to continue be more international. And so as you look at this here, you're seeing that 62% of companies in the Fortune 100 are actually driving their growth by increasing international exposures. And uh, not uncommon to that story is also the fact that the average S&P 500 company, for example, has over 55% of its revenues already coming from abroad. Now we then take that to the next level, which is interesting, is how are people thinking about this? I think it's really important here. And, and as Ernie said in the introductory remarks, it really, it's driven originally by the shareholders, by the CEOs, and by the analysts, and as well as by the boards. And they're really thinking about, okay, I'm, I will need to increase, I'm gonna go into, and that's the newest term it seems, uh, frontier markets, used to be called LDCs. And what does that really mean? And what do I need support? And the, at the outset of this, you know, and I'm thinking about here the CEO of Tyco, for example, he's really talking about, listen, we're going to go into all these different countries. And I'm sure he was thinking about, well, that, that has additional opportunity. And it obviously has, could uh, provide, provide increased worries, increased su uh, surprises, and increased business risk. So, what I'm sure a lot of you have seen as the CEOs and the boards, et cetera, uh, look at the direction, they want to have the benefit, but they don't want to necessarily take on additional risk and looking to Treasury to really transform from a cost center and possibly a compliance center to really a value add center of, okay, help us understand and manage that risk to the point that we don't have to worry about that risk. Is that possible? You clearly know, most of you, that is very possible, and I know Brent's going to talk about that some more, is, but really that's a true value add that translates at the end of the day into increased shareholder value. So Wolfgang, this is Andy. Um, as we look at the, uh, Mert, if you wouldn't mind staying on that slide for just a moment. Um, as we look at the, uh, the, the ways in which companies grow, obviously there's the, the old recipe of organic growth. But what we're seeing in a lot of these organizations is really growth fueled by bolt-on or tuck-in or, or major acquisition. So when you look at that in the contrast of, of the increased volatility and, and the increased operational complexity, where does that put the, the FX risk manager in? What are the issues that they have to contend with to, to survive in that, model, in that uh, environment? Uh, uh, an additional add-on from a value point of view, often already getting involved on the merger, um, if it's a merger and acquisition piece, on the acquisition piece of really helping them understand what that means. Very few CEOs ignore this problem today, and I would say uh, that was ignored a lot 10 years ago, but today really understanding what that means and then possibly creating the opportunity. What could that look like from a cash flow point of view? Is there some free cash flow? Is there some cheaper cash flow? What does all that mean as you're acquiring a company and integrating it and understanding those exposures is the beginning of when I understand the exposures, then what's the outcome of that from a risk point of view and then what should we do and can we benefit from that? I think that that's key on that area. Okay, great. So, so taking the macro trends, and let, let's focus in on the euro. Obviously, we've got a lot of people here that are curious about your view on the euro, uh, given the fact that you're, you're uh, frequently in, on Bloomberg and, and CNBC uh, trying to help uh, the analysts understand the impact. Um, talk to us about the, the euro. Yeah, so I mean, Euro has been front and center, and I, I think that that's an issue in itself, but, but it's certainly been front and center in the last 18 to 24 months of what is really going to happen here. You know, we used to hear the pigs a lot, but really everything is, seems to be about Greece these days. And really, Greece at the end is only a symptom of the bigger problem. And, and what, 
what, what is likely to happen here, if, if one just sums that up, is that the market in general, whether you look at the CFOs um, who've been questioned about this and believe that in the UK, 37% of CFOs believe that the euro will not be in its e existing form within this year, it will change. Or I saw a Goldman Sachs review of about a thousand uh, people interviewed where they actually thought that 75% belief that the euro would not stay in its current stage within the next 24 months. So if you're looking at the euro, you got to look at a few things. One is, what's the structure of it, and is it likely to stay the same? And the market is telling us it is not likely to stay the same. But what I'm not a huge believer in that is just going to absolutely destroy the world, <laughs> you know, and have become the biggest financial uh, uh, crisis in, in history. I do believe that that will continue to have volatility associated with it. But the bigger problem here is really not Greece, which which I believe could actually be afforded to either be funded or to actually let go. The the big issue really are number three and four here, which is all about Spain and Italy. And you've seen last week in the news where the Spaniards um, adjusted their budget deficits by increasing the projection by roughly 30 percent. That shows that the austerity that people, when they hear austerity, I always think about Greece, but actually they've had austerity packages that they've been discussing and trying to implement at Spain is actually also not working. So there's lots of uncertainty around on the euro and its current structure and remaining that way. But what, what I, think, I think what a misnomer here is that it's all about euro versus the dollar. And I think that you know what's really important here is to keep in mind, and as we're seeing an analysis done a lot around this, is you know, euro Swiss franc, euro sterling, what's going on within the euro. So keep in mind that it isn't just all about dollar euro in the United States. We keep thinking a little bit more about euro dollar only. And in Europe, a lot of people do. But they do also think about what does it mean from a sterling point of view and a Swiss franc, et cetera, point of view. So Wolfgang, as, as, you, as you examine this uh, situation, what are you starting to see in terms of how financial institutions and executives are, are responding? What are, what are some key uh, actions that you're seeing out there that are, are a sign that uh, you know, significant changes are underfoot? Well, the, the biggest thing that I'm seeing is that a lot more people are talking about what that means to the, uh, to the company from a financial perspective and then what they need to do about it and how they're communicating this um, to the shareholders, to their boards, and then have to communicate that into Treasury what they need to be done. So great examples here when we were preparing for this webinar, basically opening up the papers and looking at, well, who's commenting on it? Maybe a little bit surprising to some, but you know, you've got the CEO of Citibank uh, talking about how this actually the euro crisis could significantly impact also um, them from a financial point of view. Less surprising is that uh, CEOs of large corporations all over the world are talking about it. And maybe a little bit more surprising is that there was a significantly large article in Wall Street Journal where the CEO of GlaxoSmithKline out of uh, out of the UK talked about how they've been preparing for this are nervous about the euro and are sweeping these accounts and their cash at a very minimum just for starters all back into UK banks in brackets selling euros buying sterling impacting euro sterling and how they're forthcoming about telling their uh, investors we're getting this under control we are approaching this and we've taken some steps already and we're going to continue to take steps no different to, in the Financial Times, the article coming out of Novartis uh, CEO, who really understands um, that currency volatility is here to stay and is communicating that the value add is going to be that they're going to look at that risk, they're going to understand that risk, and they're going to address that risk so that it does not create surprises or lack of predictability in their earnings per share. So Wolfgang, obviously this has caught in everybody's attention. Uh, it's, it's, it's in the news every day. But at the end of the day, you know, th this comes down to corporate value. So as we transition into the next slide, uh, how does this really impact corporate value and how are companies uh, you know, measuring up against a, a, a benchmark? Yeah, I think this, this is a picture that uh, tells a thousand words here. 
I mean, you're really seeing, and we looked at this, is what companies are really managing this already very well today, and well, how is it impacting their EPS? What's their EPS overall story? I recognize that it's not all about, and we all do, it's not all about currencies. You have to have a fundamentally sound company, et cetera, et cetera. But part of it is, are they preparing for and are they ad understanding and addressing the risks and going through that process, or are they not? So on the left-hand side, some examples of companies with lots of reds and some greens, and we did arbitrarily pick those, those companies to look at, which are companies that have the challenge, that haven't addressed it, that you know still are kind of in the pre-2008 era of you know looking at, well, I'll try to gather my data as best I can, and. Uh, send a bunch of emails around the world and and then once I have it I don't really have any visibility towards it and most importantly I don't have any intelligence around the data because it isn't really as much about the aggregation as it is about the intelligence of the data and therefore I don't really have an ability to make better decisions in a changed environment. Now you look on the right hand side examples of, of companies who are leveraging technology who are driving to the, as an MBO to get their currency risk down to what I, I would consider immateriality and look at what their share prices are doing, what their EPS are doing. These companies are, for lack of a better term, currency agnostic. They understand the risk, they understand what risk they're willing to take and not willing to take. And that doesn't depend, it doesn't matter whether you're, no offense Brent, but you know, as, as large as Google, not that that's such an offensive statement, <laughs> but, uh, but you can also be Plantronics, you know, as a so whatever $600 million revenue company, and we see $100, $200 million revenue companies, I know you're going to address that later, who can address that just the same because that's, that's in part what technology and software services is able to do today. So this is a very solvable problem and one that can be communicated. Yeah, this is just a, an example here of, you know, what does that look like from a share price point of view? One company is addressing it and the other one is not. And I, I think that picture, again, says a thousand words. So th with that, maybe any? All right, so, so let me just conclude then by really hope that what you're, what you're getting out of this today as part of it is, first of all, currency is the biggest financial risk and it is one that can significantly impact the margins if not if not managed at all or managed um, you know in the pre-2008 era sort of processes and the other message is and in, in, in it's, it's resounding you saw it with uh, with CEOs talking earlier is that this is something that can be fully controlled and can be addressed accordingly Currency agnostic firms are weathering the euro storm is really they're weathering something because they're already prepared for it. To use Pericles' statement of, um, you know, it's not the, val the value add of a treasury to speculate and predict where a currency goes or doesn't go, but what is the job is to be prepared for what in this case all statistics point towards the inevitable. I think thirdly is that while the euro is an issue, there are other areas that one can't keep their eyes off, take their eyes off, and I would I would put China very high up there. I think I, you know, I, I would ask the audience to think about how much have they been reading on Greece, and then compare that how much have they been reading on China financing via debt commodity-based currencies, uh, countries um, such as Venezuela, one step further to looking to decouple from the US dollar. That will continue to add risk, will continue to increase in volatility from today a very low volatility environment. So important here is to not just think about the euro, not just think about the euro versus the dollar, think about the euro versus all the other currencies as well as other things that are in the hopper here. This is going to continue to stay this way as CEO of Novada said uh, for many years to come. And then lastly, and I know that um, all three, Brent, um, Lori, and Andy, are going to spend some time talking about how technology makes it practical for companies of all sizes to address this, get it under control, and being able to articulate it properly to all stakeholders. Thanks, Wolfgang. Thanks, um, we're now going to transition into a, a quick uh, audience uh, survey. Uh, so Ernie, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and tee that up here. 
Um, really what we're, we're interested in understanding from the audience based on you know, your organization today is you know, what steps have you taken uh, to deal with your own readiness? Uh, we've obviously spent a lot of time talking to companies. Uh, we know that some companies have been very uh, active in developing a, a risk management and contingency plan for the euro, and others are still trying to figure out uh, where uh, they, they need to be. So if you wouldn't mind sharing that, uh, we'll, we'll make the results of that available to the audience as well. Ernie, is there anything they need to know about the, uh, the, the quick poll here? Yeah, great. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, for those of you in the audience who are after uh, CPE credits, uh, during our event today, you're going to need to fill out um, all of the uh, polling questions. And as, as Andy uh, mentioned, we're going to be sharing um, those results uh, to the audience, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. We might use this uh, as a precursor uh, to, to a more uh, in-depth survey to give us uh, a really good sense of, uh, of what company companies are doing uh, to prepare uh, for, the, you know, for the impending euro uh, crisis throughout the rest of the year, uh, and then maybe to the point of having a, a a Euro disaster recovery plan. Um, so we have it. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, close out the poll here in about 10 seconds, and I'll just hand it back over to Andy. Andy. Um, so we're we're very happy to have Brent uh, able to take us through this next section here. Um, we've been working very closely with the team at Google uh, and the Treasury team since about 2008. And uh, we, we've watched the company, in effect, double in size over that period of time, which is just a phenomenal amount of growth. And obviously, an international uh, expansion plan is a key part of that. So Brent, as we, as we start into your section, perhaps you might be able to give us a, a quick flavor of, of the environment and culture at Google, what's really driving this phenomenal growth, and how does that translate into uh, the, 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 uh, the strategy and, and tactics that your, your team within Treasury and the FX team uh, take on a daily basis? Sure. Thanks, uh, Ernie, Wolfgang, and uh, and Andy. Um, so I won't touch too much, you know, on Google. Um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll assume most people here are, are Google users. Uh, the only point that's probably the most relevant up at the the top is, you know, as you can see, Google is Google's a pretty young company. I mean, it's a 14 year old, uh, you know, company, and the the growth has obviously been, uh, you know, phenomenal and you know, relatively unprecedented. And Probably the first thing I focused on, you can see down on the slide, we talked about the the kind of the bread and butter the treasury responsibilities. And the first thing I did focus on was was foreign exchange. And you know, obviously the other things on there are you know very relevant as well in terms of liquidity management, uh, you know, hedging as relates to foreign exchange and other risks we have. Uh, without forecasting and reporting, you can't really do any of the above. Uh, a few things to touch on, you know, that that aren't on the slide, you know. In order to grow as a company and to continue to innovate, now I'm talking about as a treasury you know, portion of a company, you know, what's necessary is to get the bread and butter down to where it is a finely you know, tuned machine. It definitely wasn't in 2007, but you know, that was relatively understandable given you know, how fast the company had grown. Um, you know, Google only had about $100 million in revenue in 2001, and it's you know, on, a, on a run rate you know, of uh, $40 billion or so. Um, a foreign exchange program is about, depending on how you count, we have three different foreign exchange programs, a cash flow hedging one, a balance sheet hedging one, and we do invest in foreign government bonds and hedge the FX risk out of that. Depending on how you count, you end up with a you know, 30 plus billion dollar uh, hedging program programs across those three. Liquidity management, we're managing about you know, 45 billion dollars you know, in cash. Um, we have, in addition to those, once once you get to the bread and butter and actually build on those, you get to build on some of the the core things that you know I wanted to drive coming into Treasury was a be best in class, so it's be best in class on the things that you have. Each one of the things on here, uh, build on those. In other words, raise the bar every year, automate everything. The only way you're going to scale is with systems. Yes, you need really good people. But you know, people really aren't scalable. You shouldn't plan on, and I don't imagine there's a treasury out there that's going to say, you know, we have unlimited call on resources and headcount. So it's not true at Google either. So systems really are the way to scale. Making sure we can analyze the heck out of everything. So you know, we don't trade anything we can't. We can granularly analyze. So you need the tools and you need the people to be able to do that. But we've been, and I won't touch on it today, but just to give you a flavor, as a result of having this down to what's you know, you're never done, but you know, being close to a you know a finely oiled machine, 
we've been able to build on these core things which we didn't have you know five years ago to be able to do things like you know green energy and tax investing you know uh, forays into customer financing we issued a credit card recently obviously lots of corporate finance activities we recently issued debt and we work on a lot of things that are strategic to the company uh, related to acquisitions you know initiatives like Google wallet which involve payments things along those lines so you need to have this stuff down, otherwise you're constantly fighting fires and band-aiding if you're going to take Treasury to the next level, and that is really what is required by CFOs and, and companies today. Yeah. So, so as okay. we we think about what you guys have been able to accomplish over the next or over the last several years, uh, you've obviously had phenomenal results. So, as we bring up the next slide here, this was a a piece that that came out in the Wall Street Journal. You can see here back at the, basically about this time last year, uh, January of last year, when a lot of companies were were struggling to to deal with the uh, the strengthening dollar at the time. And, and in effect, what you all were able to achieve during that period of time and continuously uh, before and after that event is, is an ability to in effect. Uh, operate in a currency agnostic role, uh, which you know in effect neutralizes the impact of currencies on the financial, uh, on your financial statements and financial performance. So as, as we move into the next slide here, why, why don't you start to frame up in in uh, in your mind uh, and for the for the audience here, what do you view as some of the key tenets of, of being able to be currency agnostic, and and how do you uh, achieve that? And, and at the end of the day, why does that matter uh, from a financial standpoint? Okay, if you could go back to the next slide. Just quickly, I want to touch on something that's actually in the teaser to that article, and then we'll transition quickly to the, ne to the next slide. Um, in the main of timing is everything. You know, you can see 2007, uh, you know, is when we started our foreign exchange hedging program, and it wasn't based on being prescient or having a crystal ball, um, but it really was based on what Andy just said. You know, we look, we don't look at currency as an asset class; we look at currency as a risk. And about half of Google's revenue, you know, then and you know, slightly more than half now, you know, is is outside the U.S. Um, and we do business in foreign currencies pretty much everywhere we are. And so when when I first came in, one of the things we did was we we analyzed what does that risk look like. So it wasn't about making money, as I said in the teaser to this article. It really was about okay, you have the potential. And I always want to use an insurance analogy when it comes to foreign exchange because I think that's the most appropriate one. I have a house. Do I think it's going to burn down? Probably not. Do I want fire insurance on it? Probably. Because, you know, will I feel good if my house burns down and I have fire insurance? Well, I'll feel better than if I didn't have fire insurance. I'm still not going to feel great because my preference would be the house doesn't burn down. As it turns out, when we came in in 2007, if you think about the environment that we're coming into, um, and the fact that I touched on earlier, Google had you know only been in existence at that point for about nine years. It had really been seven years or so, or eight years since you had seen a strengthening dollar. It was '95 through 2000 since the last time corporations had really been a beaten up by Wall Street and b beaten up, you know, treasurers beaten up by their CFOs for not hedging because. I think 95 through 2000, the dollar went up about 40%. So now I'm talking if you're long foreign currency. So I was coming into an environment where um, the company, you know, and companies in general that were long foreign currencies hadn't known anything but really nice tailwinds. You know, every euro that you were generating in revenue by the time you turned it into, you know, P&L or cash flow was worth more in dollars because the dollar was on a complete strength, or sorry, weakening trend. Um, but in the vein of, you know, as we've all seen in, you know, whatever bubble, you know, exists, uh, pick one, um, you know, trees do not grow to the sky and things move in cycles. And so when we looked at this in 2007, it wasn't in the vein of we think the euro is going to do X or we think the dollar is going to do Y or we think the pound sterling is going to do Z. It was in the vein of if it does something, and think of a Monte Carlo simulation, you know, here's what our risk would actually look like. And wouldn't you want to cut that bleeding off somewhere? Think of it as your insurance deductible. And so, again, it wasn't about making money. It was about risk management. Um, and we have a very mathematical management, so I, I do realize I get to benefit from that at Google. Um, but we showed them the simu you know, Monte Carlo simulations, all the relevant analyses. We did actually, you know, you know, pull out the Internet archives, if you will, and show how Wall Street viewed companies. Um, you know, that didn't manage this risk, you know, well in the past, as Wall Street does want it to take and eat it too. They don't want to know you have an FX program. They don't really care about it. But they want to know you have one 
you know, if in the case of the dollar strength. Um, and so as we looked at that, it, it was pure math. It was, you know, if you're if you're a risk manager, which is my core, I am. Um, you should do something about this. So it wasn't because we knew we were about to go into a financial crisis and we were about to, you know, at that point contribute almost 700 million. Obviously, that's a year, a year since then, so it's been a lot more since then. Um, but it was really about saying, okay, if we're going to do this mathematically, here's what we need in terms of people, in terms of tools, because, you know, it's one thing to analyze the risk, it's another thing to manage it. And so, then we went on a path, and in the vein of timing is everything. Yeah, we bought the fire insurance right before uh, you know, the fire fire broke out. So, um, you know, that was uh, you know not great because the house was burning down, but it was great because we you know did happen to have a nicely flexible risk based program with the people, and we were largely on the path of putting the tools in place for it. So, next slide. So in, in that vein, perhaps you could uh, touch a little bit more on the uh, the concept of being co currency agnostic and what does that afford uh, the, the the Google team uh, as we as we touch on the next slide here, Ernie. And and um, yeah, obviously you've made a, a very strong case for you know how you built that uh, that case for moving forward. But you know, in, in knowing that we've got companies of all sizes uh, on the the webinar yep. today, um, how should they think about that in in their in their terms? Yeah, and it's all about materiality, and you know, materiality is not is not the same number, but you know, it is going to be the same concept whether you're a hundred million dollar company or whether you're a fifty billion dollar company. And the other thing that has become very true during this crisis is that a lot of large moves in very small currencies can hurt you as much as small moves in very large currencies in terms of your exposure to those currencies, and so. You know, the, the manual process we had at the time I came in very much was dealing with, let's go with the biggies, because the biggies are a little easier to get your arm around, and it's a manual process, and so it's hard to dig through your ERP system, which we'll get into later. Um, so let's just go with the, the top tier and deal with those, because the others in aggregate, whether they be, you know, cross-currency, you know, I'm just making these up, Malaysian ringgit to Indian rupee, that probably won't matter. Well, when currencies moved as much as they did during 2008 and continue to do today, um, as it turns out, a lot of those small currencies will add up to a large amount. So the, the concept of full visibility, the concept of knowing when things net against each other, and the concept of, the mater of materiality matters. It doesn't matter how big or how small you are. It's, that's just a question of how many zeros there are next to something. And so. From our standpoint, again, it wasn't about viewing currency as an asset class, but it was about viewing currency as a risk and saying, we better understand all of our risks. We better understand where we have natural offsets, and we better under, you know, be able to get you know, rather full you know, real-time visibility to this and have a policy that enables us to deal with it and have tools that enable us to deal with all of these currency pairs because manual, manual just isn't going to cut it. So Brent, as you, you know, that, that's a fairly uh, straightforward concept, but as we transition to the next slide and, and we start to th talk about we need all of our exposure, that's not something that's, that's a trivial exercise. And, and Lori, I'm going to ask you to comment uh, at, at um, the back half of uh, uh, Brent's uh, points on this, but you know, given you guys started uh, looking at this uh, in an automated fashion uh, you know, four or five years ago and, and, and since then have in effect doubled in size. You know, how do you how do you keep the organization focused on making sure they capture all of that exposure? Yeah, and honestly, I would say it was a lot harder five years ago than it was today. Whether we you know continue to obviously you know and you know uh, we all hope we continue to you know and you know continue on a positive track. And you know if we double, triple, quadruple in size, that's just about zeros at this stage. Um, you know the the complexity whether you have a few currencies or whether you have a lot of currencies. I mean, everybody has this jigsaw puzzle, you know, that you see on this screen today. It just has, you know, different systems in it or different manual processes or different owners of it. But it is, you know, it's a jigsaw you know, puzzle or bubble gum and chicken wire, or whatever analogy, you know, or visual you want to paint for it, where you have different people that have different pieces of data here and you cannot assume that everyone, and you shouldn't assume, 
yeah, that everyone in this you know, chain of constituencies that is either going to generate an FX exposure or is going to be aware of an FX exposure is thinking about FX exposures. There's no reason for somebody in some of these places, be they, uh, you know, customers are probably thinking about it, but distribution channel or in, you know, the, somewhere in the supply chain management or in the AP department or in SDNA, they're not necessarily thinking, you know, about, oh, well, gee, I better make sure I send, you know, the one or two people that, you know, deal with FX the company to the extent they even know there's somebody that you know, does that. Um, something I just did or some decision I need to make where I have this, you know, that could create a currency exposure. So the manual, my point there being, assuming you can create this manual information flow to deal with your bubble gum and chicken wire or your jigsaw, you know, and the bigger the company gets, the more complex the company gets, the bigger that puzzle gets. Um, it's, it's not, it's naive, it's, it's not going to work. Something's gonna fall apart and it's fluid as well. That's the other thing that you know, you know you've uh, realized rather quickly about these foreign exchange exposures is they don't stay static. Some somebody's intending to do something, even if they do tell you about it, a week later something changes. The contract falls apart. Somebody creates an offsetting exposure. If you don't know about it, you end up hedging too much. You end up hedging too little. You know, and so just even having a static snapshot and assuming you can gather that all within the five minutes you need to hedge at your P&L rate to the extent that's the way you want to hedge, which is it was what a lot of people do on the shorter term exposures, it, it's just not going to work. And so early on uh, when, you know, uh, you know, I came in in 2007, you know, again, we dealt with uh, the higher level ones and we dealt with a manual process. And the company was simpler. It's gotten a lot more complex today. We bought a lot more companies, created a lot more processes, we created a lot more products that we sell through, you know, in the, into a lot more countries. Um, but at this point, those are easy add-ons because what we did back then was say, we need to build a uh, systems infrastructure that is going to deal with the fluidity. Uh, you know, of these na of these exposures is going to deal with the fact that there will be natural offsets that we need to know about. We'll be able to deal with the fact that there's going to be people, you know, well intentioned as they might be, that aren't going to think about us, you know, as you know, part of you know the constituency that they need to inform because they might not even recognize this foreign exchange exposure there, um, and is going to be able to scale for the complexity, uh, you know, that we have, and is going to be able to give it to us in as close to real time and is going to be able to give us full visibility and it's got to be able to scale. So I'm a big believer, you know, and it's, it's I guess it's part of the Google DNA is build for what you might need in the future. Don't just build for what you need today because then that's just a band-aid. And the last thing, you know, no offense to, you know, uh, you know, to fire apps, the last thing treasury people want to be dealing with is installing systems constantly. What you want to do is do something that will live with you for multiple years and will scale with you. And so that was what we recognized in 2007. And so we went down the path, you know, of, uh, you know, yes, it was fire apps, but then it was the foreign exchange capture system and the trading system and several things again, making sure they fed each other. And I don't care, again, I don't care if you're small or you're large, um, chances are you're, you have the same constraints in terms of treasury budget, in terms of, you know, having to show an ROI, in terms of having not enough IT people, you know, uh, not a large accounting staff, if any, you know, that support you. But you have that same exposure. Your house could burn down, you know, in a material fashion, and you need to be able to recognize, you know, when, you know what exposures you have, and and uh, you know, buy that insurance with whatever deductible you choose. So Lord, and don't you, and don't assume that the market is going to be stable. <laughs> I would not assume that. Absolutely, and, and I think the market is is teaching that us teaching that to us on a daily basis. Um, so, Lori, as as uh, we get ready to transition to the next slide, obviously your your firm uh, Treasury Strategies works across a broad section of cross section of industries and companies. How does this this picture that that uh, Brent has um, created for us uh, translate into uh, what you've seen uh, across your client base in terms of the the challenge of, of being able to identify these sources and, and, and create an efficient way to capture the data. 
Well, I think it really it really more than adequately represents the challenge that that a lot of companies have, regardless of revenue size, and that speaks to where Brent was talking about chicken wire and, and what have you. We see too many clients and prospects who are relying on either outdated information, not received in a standardized format, or any of that in order to capture their foreign exchange exposures. And that's really keeping them from delivering greater value to the organization. Thanks, Lori. I appreciate that. So, so Brent, what, what we've got displayed here is kind of a, a rough approximation of the, uh, uh, the flow in, in the technologies that you have in, in place within your, your Treasury uh, team here. Perhaps you could just briefly describe you know, how your, your program is set up and what some of the, uh, the enabling uh, components are in, in automating your process from end to end. Sure. And um, you know, everybody's going to have something slightly different here in terms of the box. We've been very open in terms of uh, you know, uh, how we set ourselves up from a system standpoint and uh, you know, who our vendors are. So you know, I'll add some color to you know, names in here. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the only name you can use in some of those ones you know, downstream. So everyone has an ERP system of some kind. You, know, you may have Oracle, you may have SAP, you may have something else. And so you know, now we're talking, in, we, as I get, again, I said we had several programs. We have a cash flow hedging program. Now we're talking about the balance sheet hedging program, which is our, our shorter term, you know, many, many, many currency pair exposure that really requires real time, uh, you know, fluid update in terms of data. And one of the other tenants that I didn't touch on early on in terms of what I wanted to do in Treasury, and it goes along with the, you know, systems are scalable, people are not is in order to have systems scalable, it doesn't really help if you have a system and then you have somebody extracting data from a system and entering it into another system and then extracting it from that system and entering it into another system. All you have a system. You may as well have just a built-in of a big Excel database um, you know, with some macros and you have the same human transposition error, you have the same waste of time in terms of the IQ that you have in Treasury and, you, and you, you'll have the same constraints and if you can't throw people at it. So, for me, for systems to be scalable, they have to speak to each other. And you know, I've been a big proponent of pushing vendors, you know, uh, you know, like FireApps and SunGuard, to out of the box have the the systems work together. Uh, in some cases, we you know obviously do use our IT team to build hooks between these systems. But I want data to flow in either a real time fashion or some type of flat file fashion. So with that as a precursor, we have our we have our ERP system, Oracle, which which has all of our currency pairs in it. And if you go back again, 2007, people were taking a data, a data dump of that, multiple, multiple, multiple pages of every account that may have foreign exchange in it, going through the biggies, figuring out where there's offsets, not really being able to figure out if there's any errors in there or not, um, you know, an outdated intercompany loan or something along those lines, then going in ahead and hedging those. Right now, we have FireApps that sits on top of that, sucks all of it out, nets all of that for us, um, does you know help us recognize if there's any errors you know in there, um, so that gives us our exposure management in real time, which frees up a lot of time to actually do analysis of what you should do about it. In the past, also there was no time. We, since we wanted to hedge at our P and L rate from month over month, we essentially had as soon basically as soon as we got the exposure, we had to do something about it. Now there's more IQ that can go into it. There's more analytics that can go into it. What type of hedging program? What type of insurance do you want? Obviously, there's lots of instruments out there. From the the core data to the netting of the data, and uh, then the you know, the manual analytics. Because obviously, there's a need for people here somewhere in the process. To the trade the trade execution system, to the trade capture system, as well as the accounting and the settlement. That used to be, I don't even count how many hours, and a mountain of paper. My poor FX team sitting there probably till midnight getting these trades settled, getting these trades netted, uh, because you have trades expiring at the same time you doing new trades, you may be rolling them over, um, and you know, that day of the month, maybe the same day your cash flow hedges, which are in our case all options, are also maturing. Um, so right now, there, I can't say we're completely paperless, but basically as close to it as I think you can ever get, and it's essentially feeding through all of those things. And so it, again, it's gone from a few hours, a few currency pairs, basically no time to do analytics and tons of paperwork to minutes, 
multiple times during the month if we want to, because again, things are fluid, they do update all of the currency pairs, no matter how small, because it's pretty easy to take a small currency pair, feed it through FXOL and execute on it if you don't have you know, all the paperwork you have to do at the, at the back end as well. We can deal with ad hoc changes, so we can be more fluid in terms of adjusting a hedge as we go along, and straight through process. So you know, that's night and day from where we were you know, several years ago, uh, because you know, 2007 we didn't have any of those systems. Yeah, so, so Brent, as you think about that in, in the business case, I mean, you've obviously got a tremendous amount of uh, technology at your disposal as you go through this. But as you think about the, the, the business benefit, um, where do you think you're getting the biggest bang for the buck in terms of, of the investments you've made on, on your FX program? So the, I mean, the whole infrastructure creates, you know, the bang for the buck. One that was, you know, uh, clearly the kind of the easiest, the most IT light, um, and the easiest in terms of installation, in terms of, you know, to get up and running was Fire Apps, and it replaced a purely manual process. You know, there are other choices in terms of the other things down the stream. Uh, you know, right now, it, it began, it was a data dump from Oracle, and it was, uh, you know, people going through it for eight hours, if you will, you know, and, and pulling up the largest currencies and doing something about it. Essentially, after putting Fire Apps in, uh, not only did it, you know, point out some questionable things that, you know, we needed to look at, again, this was multiple years back, um, it allowed us to clean up, the, you know, a few things. Um, you know, it, it essentially enabled us to get full visibility, uh, you know, it enables us to see where we have natural offsets. And from what I've found talking to a lot of my peer treasurers, when you don't have full data, essentially it's, you don't really do anything because, you know, if you don't know if you need to hedge, you know, I don't know, pick a number in terms of euro dollar, you might have as much risk of hedging as not hedging. So you might have a tendency to not do anything. Or you might be over hedging if you had a natural offset you didn't know about. And so, you know, this actually enabled us to very quickly see where we had, you know, netting that we needed to have done and where we had exposures um, and as well as clean things up. and. For every program we have, and this isn't just true for FX, we have benchmarks. And for for our balance sheet to hedge efficiency, again, it's insurance. What we're looking for is an efficiency measure. And the efficiency measure is if you look across all the underlying exposures that are going to be marked to market through the the PL, if you will, or balance sheet, but in the oil industry the PL, um, for the balance sheet program and the hedges we do. We want to achieve an efficiency there. When we first started, honestly, I wouldn't have signed up for a number in 2007 at all because it was just impossible to sign up for a number. After we we put fire apps in place and we, we said, okay, we let's sign up for a 90% efficiency. That seemed like a stretch, and we went relatively far down in terms of the currency pairs. As we're able to go further and further and further down as we put the rest of the things in place that allowed for a really seamless straight through processing uh, infrastructure, we move to 98% efficiency. And I add the plus there because we do better than 98% efficiency. And that means there's very little, again, it's not about making money, it's about creating the offset. So if I make money on my underline, I expect to lose money on my hedge and vice versa. But I don't expect to be surprised by one being materially better than the other, whether it's a positive surprise or a negative surprise. Surprises are not a good thing uh, because it means something's missing in the process. And so the fact that we're able to achieve that uh, with all the currency pairs that we have, you know, and at the size and complexity that we are, speaks you know volumes to what the system has been able to do for us. And you know, the stuff I said earlier as well in terms of we don't have people doing it. I'm not, you know. I'm not wasting the IQ of the people that I have on the foreign exchange team, you know, to you know, to crunch through data. So, um, as we uh, why don't we transition to slide 21 here? Because I'd like to take uh, and, and we'll make these available to to those of you who want uh, more detail on some of the uh, elements of, of the case that uh, Brent and his team made for the technology. But let let's bring this together uh, and, and talk about how. All of these technologies and methodologies have helped you and your organization weather the Euro storm. So, uh, give us your thoughts. Uh, you know, what's what are some of the specific tactics and, and techniques, as well as uh, the the overall strategy on on dealing with the Euro over the last uh, uh, couple of years here? 
Not much has changed, you know, from the the standpoint of you know the core the core requirements in terms of we better have straight through processing. We better have systems in terms of uh, you know that actually give us the data that we can analyze. I better have the flexible policies. I mean, it's not really you know, part of a, a systems webinar, but you better have flexible policies that allow to, you to adjust appropriately. Uh, we have flexible, what I call flexible risk-based policies that allow us to adjust as need be based on you know uh, what's going on in the market as opposed to having to run you know, seven levels up the management chain and something's happening and then by the time you get approval it's too late. Um, staying very close to it, you know, we don't worry about the, in the manual parts of the data. So yes, I mean obviously, you know, the yeah, you know, I don't know if you know Greece is not the crisis du jour anymore, but you know, it you know, obviously it has been and you know probably will be again. Um, or there'll be something coming out of Europe. And so staying very close to that. You know, knowing what we would do, there, there's obviously a lot of other things that you need to consider besides the, the things I said in there. Offset your exposures where you can. Stay very close to this. You know, make sure you know you're talking to a lot of people. You know, this is as much a banking crisis and not part of a systems webinar. But you know, this is much. You know, you mentioned earlier. I think on one of Wolfgang's slides was talking about you know, banking exposures in some of the, the pig countries. As much a banking crisis as a sovereign crisis, now a lot of these banks are sort of pseudo-nationalized, but you know, so you could say it's one half dozen the other, but making sure you have good is it is in place, for those who don't know, that the International Swap Dealer Association Agreement, that often comes with a collateral agreement, it should come with a collateral agreement, making sure you're managing your exposures. We don't do business with any banks that we don't have good is it is with, so we understand our, our um, uh, counterparty exposures in there. And then just back to everything else I said, you know, the uh, the automation, the automation analytics are absolutely key, and that isn't just true for FX. I mean, it's true for FX, it's true for portfolio, it's true for cash. You know, if I include all of those systems, some of which you know FX feeds into. If you go back 2007, we had 50% visibility into our cash, and it took us eight hours to get that. We have 98% visibility into our cash, cash on a real-time basis across the world. You know, whatever currency it's in, and so. That's part of staying close to the crisis, whether a bank's affected by it, knowing what money you have with them, whether a counterparty is affected by it, knowing what exposures you have with them, how it's offset with collateral. You better have these things feeding well to each other because things are moving so fast that you can't say to a CFO or a board, and a lot of us have spent a lot of time with our boards and our CFOs in the last several years, yeah, I'll get back to you. And if back to you doesn't mean in the next 30 minutes that you know, you're you're putting yourself a lot at risk. I appreciate that, uh, Brenda's great uh, great stuff. So, um, why don't we uh, go ahead and transition into the uh, next section here? We're going to bring in Lori McCauley, and we're also going to do a uh, a poll uh, here in just a moment. So, Lori, if you're ready, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, take the uh, the next uh, baton, and and we'll keep moving through this. Oh, are we? I guess we'll go ahead and do the the first polling section. Uh, so our, here's our next poll. And Ernie, any comments on the poll? Uh, yeah. So you know, so as as, as Andy mentioned before, um, the the purpose of this poll is just to, it's just to get a sense of of where our audience um, is going um, relative to their current risk management efforts uh, over the next 12 to 18 months. So so to give us some context, um, in light um, of the recent uh, recent I should say ongoing um, euro volatility, we're trying to get. Um, a good sense and benchmark uh, what companies uh, are planning to do as far as their risk management um, efforts. So at the end of the day, um, part of it is going to be, you know, we've seen some some uh, strength uh, in the euro. So so are folks really uh, going to try and get that extra insurance to burn the house down, or are they taking comfort in the fact uh, that that they have not really seen that volatility um, in the fact that there seems to be um, some movement forward um, in, in the underlying debt crisis. Uh, over in Europe. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, close the poll, and I'll go ahead and hand it over to Lori. Thanks, Ernie. So at Treasury Strategies, we've been talking for some time to our clients and prospects and, and, and really all across our global work about Treasury 3.0. What, what we're saying there is a lot of what Brent has been reflecting the idea that Treasury has a number of stakeholders 
with respect to their activities. Those stakeholders are internal, the business units that they're dealing with, and a lot of what we're talking about today involves very critical interaction with those internal stakeholders, but also there are the external stakeholders. And depending on whether you're a public company or not, those external stakeholders can be very numerous and quite varied. And particularly as relates to management and the board of directors, they're going to ask hard questions about FX. And we think in the Treasury 3.0 future state world that Treasury needs to be providing intelligence versus just data. And so that's a, sort of the precursor to the way we look at best practices for managing FX risk. So the, the, the first thing that our customers look at in terms of managing currency risk is defining and quantifying the type of currency risk to be managed. Management and the board often need some initial quantification of exposures to really make actionable decisions about the direction for an FX program. One of our clients told us about an incident where they had established a really good program to measure and hedge against transaction exposures only to get uh, dressing down from their CFO when a big translation loss occurred. So some companies, I think, have over the years focused on transaction hedging or cash flow hedging, neglecting the balance sheet side. And certainly in the realm where we are now of most companies having an ERP platform, it has uh, never been, the data is really accessible now, where it wasn't 20 or 25 years ago. The second thing is, you need to determine how you'll measure the risk that's been defined. Most companies work off of dollar exposures but um, or non-functional exposures, but others have pursued more sophisticated approaches such as cash flow at risk or value at risk. Third, you have to establish an efficient process for gathering exposures in a timely fashion. And this is really an area where many companies struggle. As I said earlier, we, we, have, we have clients that we've worked with where they're getting the exposure submitted maybe uh, on a timely basis, often not from their business units. They're getting it in a variety of different forms, whether it's spreadsheets, emails, or what have you. And so that lack of that standardization, both with respect to form and timing, is really problematic for companies. Now that you know your exposure, how will you manage them? This is really important to note that staying exposed can be just as wise as hedging in some cases, particularly if there are natural hedges. Some clients do employ, as I said earlier, processes around cash flows at risk to manage their FX exposure, but don't hedge them because they've determined that perhaps their board is comfortable with uh, the enterprise level risk that's created by those positions, or they find they have natural offsets. The thing about uh, hedging is that you cannot be swayed just by the size of the exposure. I think we heard Brent say something to that effect earlier. It's the size of the exposure, but it's also the volatility relative to your primary currency. Those two things have to be taken into account. And then finally, if you're going to hedge, you have to have an efficient and compliant process for executing, confirming, tracking, and accounting for hedges. As we look in particular at the uh, process here that we've defined, it's clear that there are problematic areas. The areas of defining risk and quantifying it, gathering exposures, as I've said, um, the covering strategy, how do we decide how to cover, a lot of companies that we work with initially have a policy that might say, I'm going to hedge 50% of my known cash flows over a certain horizon, and it's relatively formulaic. That may be the appropriate strategy, but oftentimes there needs to be consideration about how, the, whether the covering strategy, how and whether the covering strategy really do get at what's specified in the policy. And then finally, we would submit there's been a lot of trouble or maybe not so much trouble as companies not taking the time to really assess 
how have they performed? That performance might be measured in earnings per share, either positively or negatively, but it also might be, what if we'd chosen a different strategy? Do we really, do, do companies, are they going back and looking at what they've done from a performance respect across this whole chain? Because they should be. On the covering strategy, we've talked about the hedging horizon and the amounts. You need to really make sure that, that, that it's appropriate. We also feel like on the back end, the reporting and analytics around hedge execution is really critical. Whether it's exposure, are you performing your own mark-to-market -market valuations? A lot of people rely on their banks to provide those mark-to-market -market valuations, and you want to make sure that your technology can produce those independently. We think it will be critical in the regulatory environment going forward. And as I said earlier, the whole idea of evaluating your performance is critical. So in terms of a call to action, we feel at Treasury Strategies, when we work with clients, that exposure capture in a really buttoned down environment is critical to achieving Treasury 3.0 status in your activities. That exposure capture has to tie to the policies. Are you capturing the right things? Is it in a timely manner? Is it granular enough? And particularly as it relates to the Euro crisis, you want to make sure that you're getting detail with exposures within all the Euro countries. Are you, are you able to determine what are your exposures in France versus Greece versus Italy versus Portugal? That's really important. And so all of this is to really ensure that your management and you have high confidence in the details of that exposure. And then finally, measure, measure, measure. Are you, are you uh, achieving what you want in terms of your risk definition in your policy? Is senior management happy or unhappy? I'm sure if they're unhappy, they'll let you know. But do a lot of analytics around whether your hedge program is effective or not. And we feel like by following those steps, you will be well on your way to achieving a Treasury 3.0 foreign exchange program. Yeah, thank you for that, Lori. That was a great uh, way to frame up uh, the, the methodology and, and approach to this. Um, what I'm going to touch on briefly is the whole concept of taking a lot of what, what uh, both Brent and Lori have talked about and, and give you some real uh, detailed perspectives on how to, uh, to apply this in action. Before we do that, I think uh, Ernie's got another quick uh, poll that we can run through very quickly. And, and the frame of this next poll is to really try to begin to get a sense, given how currencies uh, have been plaguing companies over the last uh, couple of years uh, and, and uh, the increased appetite for risk management, um, how are companies beginning to respond to that? So this poll question is really focused on looking at your strategy over the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, with as it relates to FX, what are some of those key focal points that you're going to be working on? Is it is it establishing a currency risk management from a uh, program from scratch? Uh, because we do know that there are companies that have reached that point in uh, in their maturity that they need to start beginning to take steps to manage that. Uh, is it to take an existing process that you've been working with over the last uh, you know few years and, and beginning to uh, set it up for uh, being able to. Uh, keep up with the strategy and, and the increased volatility in the market? Uh, or are you looking to, uh, as, as Bryn has done, begin to tie the pieces of the technologies together into a more efficient and integrated process? Or are you dealing with uh, a very complex environment where through acquisitions you've developed uh, numerous places within the organization that could house exposure, multiple ERP systems or planning systems? So in your mind, what are some of those key focal points of your, of your efforts over the next 20, uh, 12 to 18 months? So at the end of the day, you know, you, you, you've seen a great example of, of a company with, at Google that has taken an approach to, to managing uh, currency risk and in, in to in think about the euro. And as we work with our clients, and I know Lori in working with their clients at Treasury Strategies, has seen, you know, we've seen various levels of sophistication in terms of how companies are trying to address the euro threat. And, one approach is similar to Google, where you take a very methodical, uh, analytical approach. The other is to, you know, try to guesstimate what might happen based on, you know, a thumb in the air perspective on on which way the winds might blow. I think we would advocate a, a more systematic approach. So as, as you go into this, you know, what can this ultimately look like? So we, we spend a lot of time talking about 
uh, in, in Lori's section, beginning to start with an understanding of your exposures and an understanding of your risk and what does that mean from a management standpoint. So if we transition to the next slide, this is a, an interesting way to begin to frame this up. Um, this is what we call at FireApps a core analysis. And in effect, what it does is helps the company uh, take its, its overall exposure and understand the, the inherent risk in that portfolio of exposures and then looking at the underlying hedging instruments that they may be able to invoke to, to reduce that risk, what is the cost benefit of, of in implementing those hedges here? So what you're, you're seeing depicted here on the left side is, a, is an axis that, that uh, calculates the overall risk. On the bottom is going to be the cost or, or benefit of the forward points on your hedges. And what we can very quickly do, given the fact that we can pull all this information from across your enterprise, is quantify the exposure and help you understand the overall cost or benefit of managing that risk and help you make an informed decision at the end of the day, how much risk is the organization willing to sustain given the volatility in the markets and, and what are they willing to pay to reduce that risk. So how do we bring that into, into, uh, into action? Um, if we move to the next slide here, what FireApps brings to the table to enable companies like Google's and others uh, to, to achieve this is a cloud-based exposure management platform. And it's designed to work very seamlessly with your existing exposure data sources, whether it's an ERP system, a planning and budgeting system, uh, a, an exposure forecast from a business unit. We can assimilate all of that information and very quickly help you identify not only the sources of exposure, but very quickly quantify what that exposure and the associated risk with that exposure is. So you can get an aggregate view. Uh, you can determine if there's opportunities for uh, organic exposure elimination or natural offsets, such as uh, uh, Brent's team has done uh, repeatedly uh, throughout their program, and ultimately make an informed decision about how you may want to manage that. And I want to be the, the uh, I want to make an important point here from our standpoint <clears throat> is as we help companies uh, engage in, in managing their exposures. There's an obvious uh, uh, action to to hedge uh, exposures, but we also find a lot of companies with proper analytics can do a lot to eliminate exposures organically. So it's not necessarily just about what you can hedge. It's really more appropriate about what can you identify and what can you manage. And that's really the key to a, to a successful uh, exposure management program at the end of the day. So given that framework, um, how can we start to uh, focus this on the euro? Well, one of the packages that we've, we've developed uh, in, in support of our client base is the ability for us to come in and, and pull out information from across the enterprise and be able to look at the exposures that are sitting on the balance sheet, be able to look at the exposures as they're flowing through the income statement. So you can very quickly assess what your overall exposure is to the euro and where it's really coming from. Based on this information, similar to what you heard from Brent, you're now empowered to take uh, actions very quickly to uh, eliminate those exposures. It may identify places where you may need to sweep uh, cash accounts to eliminate exposures, where you might be able to set up some intercompany relationships that more efficiently uh, reduce the exposure related to the euro. But at the end of the day, you want to be armed with both the tactical and strategic weapons that you need to, to deal with that. So this URX program is designed to help you get a quick start on that. And something can be done in a very short period of time without a tremendous burden on the rest of the organization, either from IT, accounting, or treasury, to, to get this initial view of how to deal with the exposures. And to kind of you know give you a visual of what that looks like, what we have the ability to do is pull this information together for you into a framework where you begin to understand the exposures, and then look at that across trends. We can dissect it by uh, monetary asset and liability class. We can dissect it by revenue flows, uh, cost of sales flows, operating expenses flows, and tie it back to specific entities and specific accounts or, or line items with the income statement that will give you a very crisp understanding of what those exposures are. From there, you're now very empowered to deal with you know, the, 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 the strategies on, on how to deal with that at a very tactical as well as strategic level. Now, one of the challenges that you deal with, and, and we recognize this with our companies, is that all companies have uh, to deal with different circumstances. So if we transition to the next slide, um, we firmly recognize that companies are at different levels of readiness to, to engage in something like this. Uh, we have companies that, that we work with that are starting from scratch. They don't know where their exposures are. They, they don't exactly even know which systems the, the, that exposure might be coming from, from various parts of the business. Uh, they may have numerous systems that they're dealing with. 
and they may not understand what, what they can do to efficiently get that view of exposure that allows them to very quickly deal with the, the, the risk associated with that. So as a, as a result of that, we, we've created a, a series of packages that cater to the specific needs of companies based on where they are in the overall uh, maturity of their FX program or the complexity of their business. So if we move to the next slide, this is a few examples of those types of packages that are, that are uniquely suited to the individual clients based on their needs. So if you're in a situation where I don't have a program, I'm just starting from scratch, I don't even know what my exposures are, back to, to Lori's point, the first part in, in developing that risk management program is to focus in on that exposure. So we've got a, a, a solution and an associated set of methodologies that can take you through that initial phase of getting up to speed on what your exposures are, determining what you can do organically and internally, and then determine at the end of that, does it make sense to engage in a hedging program? And if so, what exposures should I be hedging based on the associated risk and exposures that, that are coming out of your business. We also know that there are a lot of companies out there today that have a program that's been working well for them over the last couple of years, but due to the increased volatility that we're seeing in the marketplace or growth and acquisition plans that are driven by your, your, uh, your CEO and, and his, his or her drive to, to continue to grow the business, your existing program may not be able to keep up with where the company's going. So, we can take that existing environment and, and, and enable it to make it to the next level and, and support your organization as it continues to grow. We also know that there's a lot of companies out there that have grown through acquisitions over the last several years. We've got several companies in our customer base that have numerous ERP systems. We've got one that's probably got over 80 ERP systems that, that are creating uh, or have sources of exposure uh, contained within, within them. Our OneView solution uh, deals with that particular set of challenges and can provide a consolidated view of your exposures across all of the ERP systems or exposure sources that are sitting out there in the enterprise. And it doesn't have to be uh, a long, drawn-out process to get there. Based on our cloud-based technologies and our ability to very quickly pull information out of the enterprise and make it rationalized and, and consumable for you, we can do this in a very expeditious manner and give you that consolidated view that more importantly than anything else you can trust is an actual fact-based uh, assessment of your exposure and risk. And then we have the, the final set of clients that, that are also looking at, at taking their, their program and really taking it to the next level, tying together all the component parts within their, uh, their treasury technology stack, whether it's bringing data from an ERP system, uh, doing the exposure analytics, uh, integrating with a trading platform such as 360T or FXAll, or the various treasury management systems that are out there, weaving that together into an, a cohesive, efficient, and effective process is really taking that to the next level, as you've seen with what uh, uh, the team at Google has done. So we've got solutions that deal with the challenges of pulling that information together and, and creating that streamlined process. And we'll have some upcoming webinars over the next uh, few weeks here that if you're interested, you can uh, come in and learn more about these specific uh, uh, applications. So with that quick vignette on, on uh, the capabilities that we bring to the table to help companies deal with the euro from a, a technology standpoint, um, I'm going to uh, send it back over to Ernie and we can work through uh, the Q&A here with the time remaining. Sounds great. Um, uh, thanks very much, Andy, and thank you to all the other speakers for the great content. I'm just going to go ahead and take a few uh, questions here. And uh, what we'll do, we have a lot of questions teed up. What we'll do uh, is we'll work uh, with the speakers to get those questions answered and up on Proformative. So we want to make sure that we address all your questions. We had uh, a lot of great content that took a bit, little bit longer um, than we than we had planned, but I think there were some great insights to be learned from the content. If it's okay, um, I'll start uh, with with uh, Wolfgang. Um, you know, there, there are those who claim that the Euro is going to survive intact throughout 2012. Uh, what do you think that those people uh, are missing at this point? <laughs> Um, I think that they are I'm not sure what they're missing, but more of that they're being very hopeful and uh, ignoring at the end of the day um, reality of economics. Um, I think that the the euro uh, was built with some assumptions that just didn't hold true, which is include macroeconomic movements such as movement of uh, people for jobs, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at the financial picture of that, um, you won't want to look at that long term it doesn't really work 
um, but you want to do it in a fashion where the euro can actually absorb any um, issues around creating disasters or not, and I think that that's going to happen in a very uh, proper fashion. But overall, I mean, if you look at the financial pictures with percentages of GDPs of countries, if you look at what uh, what guidelines were put in place on day one and how fast just about every single country started going against those and continues to, how those austerity packages are unfortunately not having the impact that they want. You know, not that dissimilar to financial institutions may not be lending as much as they'd like to. So I think that there's a lot of fundamental from a financial as well as economic point of view, not to mention non-unity of political efforts. Oh, great. Um, thank you, Wolfgang. Um, Laurie, um, I have a question here uh, around uh, maybe some generalizations about how you would suggest a company uh, kind of take the initial steps in right-sizing uh, the technology uh, that's right for their firm in managing their FX risk. Well, and again, I think, and Brent mentioned this as well, technology across FX encompasses the exposure capture, which I think Andy in his last slide was um, very good at delineating the different ways to get started if you're just starting out um, with, with the Fire App products. So from the exposure management and capture side, there are a lot of alternatives. And then with respect to the trade capture, analytics, and hedge accounting, if, if you're electing hedge accounting, that tends to involve other platforms as well. There's no single platform that really does it all and is the perfect system. Um, so it, it's, it's making sure that you have something, usually other than Excel spreadsheets, to capture the exposure, to, to capture your hedges and your trades, and then confirm and account for them. And those typically involve different platforms like a treasury management system and uh, perhaps a separate accounting system. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to direct a, a, a question um, to Brent and see if he's able to answer this uh, for us. Um, would you say the biggest challenge as far as managing FX risk was more on the translation exposure or the transaction exposure that, that you faced? Uh, if by translation you mean P&L, sometimes people mean balance sheet translation, and that definitely wasn't. Uh, if you mean translation, that, were, that in terms of uh, our P&L hedging pro program, otherwise referred to as the cash flow hedging program, which was going out, you know, 18 months. Um, that one, you know, was difficult because it was, you know, we have a uh, largely 18 months, but out up to three years rolling program. Difficult for a company like Google to actually, you know, look out three years in terms of uh, I mean, technology. So it's hard to look out three years and, you know, and uh, do a forecast. Um, however, that one didn't doesn't require as much of a level of precision as the balance sheet program. Um, so I would say, from that, from a decision, from a purposes of granularity and need to absolutely have it right, as well as knowing whether you didn't have it right within about 30 days, the balance sheet program was harder. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Brent. I'm going to um, close out the Q&A question and, and the, be mindful of our time here um, with a question uh, for Andy. Um, and, and what you're seeing, uh, what would you say um, is the biggest challenge um, that you're seeing uh, for companies as, as far as just kind of taking that first step and, and identifying their FX exposures? Is it the quality of data, the systems, the people? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Well, it, 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 you see a, a number of different challenges based on, on uh, the, the unique situations of each each company. Um, I think one of the things that, that we have uh, seen quite a bit of is that Treasury still uh, has to fight for budget and resources. And um, there are a number of things that are happening across companies today to uh, make that a challenge. Um, so the, the way that we try to attack that is to make this uh, as easy for companies to, to focus on getting that exposure uh, snapshot uh, with as with few impact on resources as, as we possibly can. So, uh, you know, trying to, to alleviate the strain on IT, on the dependence on IT, and, and trying to alleviate the need to, to get uh, a huge team involved to do this, when in fact this can be done in, in a matter of a, a few days' time to get that initial view uh, of their exposure, which is one of the key ways to get over some of the inherent obstacles in doing anything 
uh, of, with a company of any size of complexity and, and uh, you know, multiple priorities. Great. Um, thank you very much, Andy. With that, I'd like to close the Q&A session. Uh, and, and also, um, I'd like to remind you that we will be um, answering, answering uh, the questions we didn't get here to uh, during our webinar today. Um, we, we would like to thank Wolfgang Coaster, uh, Frank Kalinikos, Lori McCauley, and Andy Gage for their time and insight. Um, if you'd like us to connect you with any of them, please indicate that on the survey, which we will invite you to take right after the webinar is over. These folks are leaders in their field and an excellent source of information on today's topics. Uh, thanks again to our today's primary sponsor, uh, Fire Apps, whose commitment to thought leadership allows us to offer uh, this program this morning. Uh, just as a reminder, for CPE credits, if you did not check the box to receive CPE credits when you registered for the webinar today, you will see um, the email for Tanya Walsh in order to get your certificates. You can send her an email. Um, and then I'd like to close that with a note that we are going to continue uh, to partner further um, with Fire Apps 2012 to offer education and thought leadership around currency uh, risk management. Things will be coming soon. We'll include uh, benchmarking surveys and also uh, further uh, FX risk management webinars. Finally, I'd like to conclude today by thanking you, the audience, uh, for your valuable time. And we hope to see you on performative.com. And I would like to wish everyone uh, a great day. Thank you very much, everybody.